Hey, folks, Damian Mason coming at you. Before we hop into another fantastic episode of the Business of Agriculture, I want to tell you about Pattern Ag. Pattern Ag is a company that has pioneered predictive soil analytics. You know, we always treated diseases and pests after they were already in the field, when they were already causing us a problem. But what if you can do this proactively through predictive soil analytics? Pattern has a technology that through their technology, you can say, oh, here's the likelihood that I'm going to have soybean cyst nematode. Here is the prediction on how bad of a risk I face for sudden death syndrome or corn rootworm and a whole bunch of other diseases and pests. When you know what your risk factor is, you can more efficiently and proactively treat for the disease. You can do this by going to pattern.ag and figuring out what your risk factors are through predictive analytics. That's right. Go to www.pattern.ag and then get a hold of your Pattern Ag representative to help you do predictive analytics on your farming operation. Well, greetings and welcome to another fantastic episode of the Business of Agriculture. It's me, your host, Damian Mason, and I want you to sit back and enjoy this educational session because we're talking about fats and oils and we're talking about where all this stuff that you use every day comes from and how it happens. I've got Chris Peterson. He's the president of a company called Hero BX out of Erie, Pennsylvania. I lived there for 14 weeks in the summer of 1992 working for an oil absorbent company. So, uh, I haven't talked to anybody ever on this show about uh, 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 from, from I'm sorry, from Erie, Pennsylvania. But uh, here we are. So, Chris Peterson, <clears throat> we're going to talk about your industry, which is uh, pretty big and it's kind of behind the scenes. Not a lot of people know what happens, but we know there's a soybean field and we know there's a corn field. And then we know there's a thing called renewable diesel, biodiesel, ethanol. We're talking about sustainable aviation fuel. We're also talking about this entire thing out here. We talk about oil seeds. Where's all this go? How's it happen? You're going to be my expert on that today. So uh, tell us about your company and what you do. And then let's talk bigger picture about the industry. And the reason, by the way, dear listener, we're covering this is because I'm going to be a speaker for the American Fats and Oils Association on October 13th in Savannah, Georgia for their national convention. So popular and such a big industry. In fact, they've closed registration for the convention already. So if you don't think it's a big industry, it's a big industry. Anyway, talk to me about your company and what this whole industry looks like. Sure. My company is Hero BX. And specifically, we are a multi-state, multi-feedstock biodiesel producer. So we take feedstocks ranging anywhere from virgin vegetable oils like soybean oil or canola oil, and all the way down to rendered animal fats or recycled cooking oil or other waste greases. Uh, And we turn those into a fuel that is compatible with diesel fuel. It can be used as a transportation fuel. It can be used, uh, you know, in off-road applications like farmers' tractors, uh, or it can be used in home heating applications, specifically like in the Northeast and the New England states, they're still using oil heat up there. Yeah, so... Uh, I'm in Indiana. Here my farm is. There's three ethanol plants within about 30 miles here. There's mm-hmm. a poet, uh, there's a central Indiana ethanol, and there's a, another one. And to be honest with you, I can't remember the name of it right now. Um, what's different about what you do there at your facility versus these eth- these ethanol plants? People sell their corn. You know what? Uh, take your corn there, dump it, and then they turn it into ethanol. What do you do that's different than that? Sure. Uh, what they're doing is they are utilizing starches and sugars in corn to ferment an alcohol. Uh, that is then blended with gasoline. We take uh, products that are are oils, greases, lipids, um, triglycerides, and we specifically are are mixing those triglycerides with an alcohol like a methanol or an ethanol, uh, and we're creating a chemical reaction making a a methyl ester. Uh, One of the byproducts of that process is glycerin, which is then used as a feed ingredient, it's it's in the gel caps of you know the Tylenol that you're taking. Uh, it's in cosmetics, it's in soaps, in detergents. Uh, so one of our byproducts or co-products is is in something that uh, you know most people are using every day. Okay, so that's the gel product that you just said, but that's not your main stuff. That's a byproduct. Correct. Main stuff. What you, you're you're taking. By the way, you take in all this stuff. Like, uh, so where's it come from? I mean, uh, you you take. The facility that um, processes soybeans, they talk about the crush. Explain that a little bit. Soybean Correct. crush and the meal and the oil and all that. Yeah, sure, sure. So, so take me from the it, field of soybeans it, to, to end user. Yeah, essentially what happens there is the farmer grows soybeans. Uh, the soybeans are harvested. They're taken to a processor. Uh, the main product or, or the main 
reason for crushing that soybean is for the meal, which is a protein. Uh, that protein is then, uh, you know, sold into largely into the animal feed industry. Uh, one of the resulting co-products or, or byproducts is the oil. Uh, that oil can be used in a number of different ways. It's a very flexible product. Uh, it, it can be used in, in the manufacture of plastics, foams. It can also be turned into a fuel, and, and that's what we do with it. Uh, we take that soybean oil, we, we blend it with uh, with methanol and a catalyst. We create a, a methyl ester, which is then uh, blended further with petroleum diesel fuel. You don't start with soybeans. You start with the oil that comes from another process. We start with, we start with the oil. That's correct. Okay. So in between the soybean field and the end user, there's a couple of stops. Somewhere it goes and gets made into oil. I think right. I uh, when I had a soybean expert on here once... 80% of a soybean is oil, 70%, something like that? Uh, no, it, it's it, it's mostly meal. Um, okay, it's mostly meal, so it's the other way around. So it's correct, mostly meal correct. and it, it, it's, right? mo it's mostly protein and, and uh, you know, a little bit less uh, is oil. Now, that that is one area of research and, and something that, uh, you know, the scientific community, you know, the agricultural engineers are, are very interested in. They can modify that genome and make a soybean that has more oil or less oil, more protein, less protein. Uh, farmers and, and agriculture engineers are, are doing the same thing on the corn, uh, you know, making corn with more oil or less starch or more starch and, and less oil. Uh, another interesting note, one of the other feed products that we can take is a byproduct of the ethanol production. And within that at uh, ethanol facility, when they take and extract the, the sugars to, to make the alcohol, mm -hmm. they're also producing uh, dry distiller's grains. Mm -hmm. There's some oil or lipid in that DDG. Right. And they're able to extract that now. And that oil, most of it goes into biodiesel manufacture. Some of it still goes into feed, but most of it's going into biodiesel or renewable diesel. Yeah, so I know that dried distiller's grain was a big thing as part of the rations at these dairies and, and feed yep. yards. They're taking dried distiller's grain, which is a byproduct of the ethanol. <clears throat> uh, a corn, a corn is about eighty percent carbohydrate. Is I if I if my nutrition classes uh, uh, serve me correctly. So you're using mostly the carbohydrate, but then there's that protein source. But you're saying that then within the dried distiller's grain, um, rather than just feeding it to the cattle, we're actually going to figure out a way to yank out the lipid and use it for what? Uh, that oil can then be used the same as, as soybean oil or, or rendered animal fat, and it can be turned into, uh, you know, a methyl ester or biodiesel or renewable diesel. So renewable diesel has a lot of excitement going. And, you know, we here in places like Indiana, where we grow a lot of soybeans, are excited to hear about this future. Is it for real? It, it is, um, you know, looking five years, 10 years down the road, uh, you know, renewable diesel is, is probably going to be the, the you know, the future of, of renewable fuel on the diesel side. Um, the reason I say that is, is if you look at the growth in, you know, the, the diesel side of the industry, it, it's coming from conversions of you know, existing petroleum refineries, you know, into renewable diesel production facilities, um, you know, rather than. You know, each company is different and they've got their own reasons. But generally speaking, uh, you know, the, the petroleum refining industry is, is dying, has been dying for some time. Uh, you know, the consumption of, of petroleum products, uh, refined petroleum products is decreasing you know, over the course of time. So, well, we now, obviously, the, the, the push, you know, California's governor says we're going to outlaw gas engines and, and then he says mm -hmm. we're going to outlaw diesel engines. So where does all this diesel go if we outlaw these engines? You know, is is that even really right now? It seems it seems it seems well economic suicide because it's not even possible, right? And we don't need to get political here, but it's it, requiring electric cars when you can't even satisfy the grid right now. I mean, there's a lot of asinine things happening, and that's why we think California is crazy. But in a future with no uh, with battery powered automobiles, is this business does, this, does your business go away? No, I don't think it does. Uh, you know, you're just thinking on on the you know on on the private citizen side, looking commercially. Uh, I, I don't see heavy trucks or uh, railroad locomotives being converted to electric anytime soon. 
So okay. you, you've got a legacy fleet of, of trucks that are hauling products. It's just a physical impossibility products. is what you're saying. I mean, that's that's the point that I would make. The average person that's driving around their little uh, uh, Prius maybe doesn't fully grasp that, but a, a damn right. train, <laughs> you can't have enough battery power to move a locomotive or a freight ship, for God's sakes, right? Right, right. There, there There's, for the foreseeable future, There, there's going to be a need for distillate type fuel whether that is from renewable sources or from uh, you know fossil fuels or or petroleum based you know that, that's where the argument truly lies and, and how much feedstock exists you know globally uh, nationally regionally uh, to to push that production and and to supplant some of that uh, that that fossil fuel and that petroleum product yeah so if it if we somehow have a future without any internal combustion engines, maybe you're talking that's twenty years from now, just because of the just because the physical incapability for that to even happen. So, the industry is good. Do we have? I had a guy on that we talked specifically about renewable fuels, and I said, uh, okay, we got ninety million or so acres of soybeans. Uh, here's how much goes to animal feed, you know, export, whatever. And he said, we'll take it all. I said, what? And he talked about the amount of is it true that we are almost we're under capacity on our production because we there's enough demand with this renewable because we didn't even talk we talked about biodiesel in the old days but renewable diesel this is a new thing and is it going to be the new thing uh i i certainly believe it is and right now the, the the constraint is uh just in in feedstock quality you know some of these refineries that are being converted now uh, are, and are feedstock, very by the way, to, to a person that's listening to this that's in the livestock industry, you mean feedstock, meaning feeding your plant. You mean the stuff that comes in that feeds the, your the, the raw materials in, in in the case of renewable diesel or or biodiesel. I'm I'm talking about the the oils, the the vegetable oils, the animal fats. That that is our raw material. That is our feedstock. Yep. So right now, the the concern through a lot of the renewable diesel industry or or the the uh, the the plant capacities that are being converted right now is they struggle to be able to process the level of metals and the free fatty acids that are you know naturally in those oils. So they're they they need to have those removed prior to arrival at the plant for conversion into renewable diesel. So there is um, you know the, the the vegetable oil industry has several projects underway uh, to increase refining, not only crush capacity, but refining capacity. Uh, several of the oil companies uh, have bought and invested in their own pretreatment facilities. Several and of the oil companies, when you say oil company, you mean just people that do what you do, or do you mean like big oil, Exxon? Big, 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 big oil, the, 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 the Exxons, the P60s, the Marathons, absolutely. Uh, you know, they, they, they've all got, uh, you know, a, a, a space in the renewable diesel industry right now they've, they've all got manufacturing facilities that are operational or being converted uh and right now you know a couple of them are, are farther down the down the path or or the learning curve than than others and they have additional assets marathon for example has a, a couple of uh, facilities where they are buying these unrefined feedstocks cleaning them up to to where they're able to be utilized you know, in their renewable diesel production facilities and the yeah. size of these facilities compared to, you know, we in Erie have a, a 50 million gallon per year plant. And that was, you know, top five, top 10 in the country for quite a while in terms of, the, of biodiesel. Some of these new renewable diesel plants that are coming online are 800 million gallons a year out of one facility. <laughs> You said you're uh, 50 million, and and a decade ago you'd have been a top five producer, and you're talking about places that are 13, 12 times what you are, and that's coming online. Yes, um, one of the you know the the largest uh, renewable diesel producer right now is a joint venture between Darling Ingredients uh, and Valero. Uh, it's a a plant or a facility company called Diamond Green Diesel. Uh, their large facility is in uh, Louisiana. They're bringing in a second facility online in Texas, and combined, they're going to be a little over a billion gallons of annual production out of one company. <clears throat> Remind, okay, and in, in in layman's terms, biodiesel versus renewable diesel. The difference is 
biodiesel versus renewable diesel is the, the difference is chemistry and the production process. In renewable diesel, essentially they are hydro treating. Um, they, they are taking that that oil, that soybean oil, animal fat, used cooking oil. They're putting it under pressure and at very high temperatures. They're cracking it and, and changing physically changing the 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 uh, the, the carbon chains of of that oil. Uh, and turning it into a renewable diesel product, much like you would crack uh, a barrel of petroleum, you'd end up with some gasoline, some diesel fuel, some residual oils, some heavy oils, uh, and then, uh, you know, tar or asphalt. Uh, yeah, I remember I, I learned about this back when I was like, back in the days when they told us we were going to run out of oil uh, in 40 years, that was 45 years ago that they told me that, and we're mm -hmm. still not out of oil, but <laughs> anyway, I digress. Uh, a cracking tower, yes, where essentially it's the distillates and that kind of thing. Correct. Saying, we're doing that with, we're, we're, we're taking soybean oil mm -hmm. and doing that same thing yep. and and refining it into yep. fuel, and that's renewable. That That is the renewable diesel, correct. Okay, then what's biodiesel? Biodiesel is um, a process called transesterification, where you take that same feedstock material, that same oil, uh, you introduce an alcohol and a catalyst, and you create a chemical reaction, uh, and then you you essentially then are creating what is called a methyl ester, which is the biodiesel and a a byproduct or a co-product glycerin. So yes. you, you're breaking you're breaking the triglyceride. Uh, with the alcohol, uh, and then you're, you're breaking that into monoglycerides, and then chemically the the alcohol molecule is is mating to those uh, monoglycerides and converting them to methyl esters. That's a little bit of chemistry. I want you to explain that before you do. I want to talk about explaining some other stuff. Um, I want you to think about this: the revolution in agriculture is going to be about finding information. You know, my friend Rob Syke started a company called AgVisor Pro, and AgVisor Pro was founded on one of his big premises. He says, when you can shorten time and space, there is money to be made, shortening time and space. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of concept of AgVisor Pro. You've got questions. You, you know that farmers spend 19% of their time seeking information. That's a lot of time that could be applied to something more fruitful. So go to AgVisor Pro. It's a it's a revolution in information, if you will. It's an app that you put on your phone. Uh, it's a bunch of independent professionals that are out there floating around that have the expertise that you might require. You go to AgVisor Pro. You just put the app on your phone. It's as simple as that. And then you can tap into this network where you get the information that you require. You also could become an expert on AgVisor Pro. Pull up the app, put it on your phone, kick around on it for a while. You'll be happy that you did, and you'll thank me. It's AgVisor Pro. All right, all those things you just said there, uh, Mr. Peterson, um, were um, a little complex for somebody that got a C in, uh, in, in Purdue in Chemistry 112. So <laughs> help me out here. Uh, on the biodiesel, we're, our process is different. You told me it was more akin to refining for renewable diesel. Mm -hmm. What you guys do is not a refining process. That, that, that's correct. We are, we are utilizing chemistry and physics uh, in, in our process. Uh, we're, we're creating a chemical reaction. You can do this. This is very simple. You can do this actually in your own kitchen. You can take a a, a, uh, a, a container of, of soybean oil, canola oil, corn oil that you buy in the grocery store, uh, you know, introduce some alcohol to it. Now you're going to have a hard time. It, you're most likely looking at, at like a grain alcohol or, or a, a very high alcohol content uh, product mm -hmm. out of the liquor store, you know, introduce those two in, in a glass beaker. Over the course of time, you're going to start to see the, the glycerin molecules drop out. They're heavier, so they'll go to the bottom. You'll have a layer of, of glycerin across the bottom of, of the container, mm -hmm. and then the biodiesel will, will end up you know, on the top. Uh, so like I said, you can do this. It, it's very simple chemistry. Uh, you know, the 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 art is in the execution and you know, doing this at, at a commercial scale and, and producing, uh, you know, quality that's able to go into the fuel stream. Yeah. So your stuff comes there at your facility. Where, what are you bringing in and turning into biodiesel? Uh, we have done a lot of research over the course of time in terms of uh, blending. We're able to, because of our multi-feedstock capabilities, we're able to take a multitude of products. So we're buying what's most economical on the market on a daily basis. That could be rendered animal fats from 
uh, you know, a, a pork processing plant, a beef processing plant, uh, a little bit of poultry fat. We use use cooking oil collected out of restaurants, uh, virgin vegetable oils, soy and canola. Uh, with our facility in Erie, we're close enough to the Canadian border where there are some canola processing plants where from time to time, you know, it's made economic sense to to touch canola oil. So any number of, of products are, are, are coming into our plant on a daily basis. But they are oils when they come in. You, Correct. You, they're oil. They're oils. Now, several years ago, I spoke for uh, National Renderers Association. That's the yeah. other NRA. Yeah. And I learned a little bit about this industry so I could actually be knowledgeable enough to talk to them. And most people don't even think about that, that, you know, everything that gets slaughtered into meat there's a whole bunch of stuff that then gets rendered and made into other stuff. And so the sure. fats and the tallow and all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. gets cooked into an oil. When it comes to your place, it's, it's an oil, but it don't matter to you. I mean, as long as it's, it's, as long as it comes in as an oil, you guys can make it work. Correct. That, that That's uh, an oversimplification, but yes, it, it is accurate. Are you calling um, me simple? Did you just call me simple? No, <laughs> no I did not. I think you got to take the complex and make it simple. So that way uh, it, it's understandable for everybody. So this stuff that comes in, it don't matter what it comes in and in what form you do the same thing to it. For the most part. Yes. It, it, it's now the, the trickery is, is in, in what we call pre-treatment. And what we do is, is we remove excess free fatty acids. We remove uh, you know, some of the metals, some of the other contaminants that, that don't, um, generally convert you know into methyl ester or into fuel uh, so we'll we'll process we'll clean up those oils you know in in one building or in one part of the plant and then when that is done we'll process we'll, we'll process them over into the you know the actual biodiesel side of the facility so we handle each of those different types of feedstock a little bit differently in terms of temperatures uh chemical addition uh you know the the amount of of water that's introduced Mm -hmm. uh, you know, to to help remove those metals and, and other contaminants. Uh, so there, there's a little bit of, of difference on the pretreatment side. And then from the, you know, the biodiesel reaction, uh, that side is, is pretty similar no matter what we're using as a raw material. Uh, this conference I'm going to be speaking at on October 13th in Savannah, uh, it's a huge association. And I can see companies like you being there, fats and oils are what you take and turn mm -hmm. into something. Who else is going to be at this kind of thing? What, 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 tell me about a membership of an organization. You're pretty active in the association. Sure. Uh, this is yeah. an entire industry that most people think about. Just like I talked about renders, most people eat steak and they don't realize, yeah, the cow that that came off of, <laughs> the part that wasn't meat, it got it got used also. The bones got made into something, the mm -hmm. tallow, the hide, all that stuff. So there's a, there's a whole bunch of stuff out here where they're using fats and oils. You obviously think of, okay, go to the store and buy you some Wesson oil, and it might be made out of, I think it's made out of corn oil, you know, Mazzola, whatever, uh, canola oil, sunflower oil. There's that, but then the stuff that's, that's for human consumption, there's a bunch of it doesn't directly go into a bottle that we buy at the Kroger, right? Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. From the, 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 the vegetable oil side, you know, some of it goes into, uh, get, get sold to restaurants, McDonald's, fries, uh, you know, all of their fried products in uh, in soybean oil or vegetable oils. Uh, so a lot of it is used primarily for cooking. Uh, it gets used, you know, as, as an ingredient in the baking industry. Uh, you know, your donuts, your your cookies, that, that you know, th those types of, of baked products uh, you know, contain vegetable oils. Yeah. So some process, some, some bakery somewhere uh, is bringing in veg soybean oil or whatever, canola oil, whatever mm -hmm. it should be by the tanker load. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, we see a lot of it. We buy product from potato chip factories. You know, once they're done cooking the chips, they cycle their oil out every, you know, every so often. Uh, we'll we'll buy the the used cooking oil from the potato chip factories. There, there's now, a lot a place, of places. That, that, that's a place when we talked about before we hit record. And I want you to explain this side of the industry also. Uh, a huge potato chip factory is going to have oil in large quantities. They can mm -hmm. then have somebody that sits at their computer and sells their used oil to somebody like you. Absolutely. But. You can see where that's an actual industry of mm -hmm. like, hey, they just know that there's oil brokers, whatever. But then the the Mexican restaurant down here that uh, is owned, but you know, by 
just a, 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 a man and his wife, <laughs> they don't have the resources and they don't have a 8,500 gallon tanker truck of this to get rid of every, you know, 10 days. They've got a couple of fryers. What's happened with that space? Because you told me that's actually turned into a business. It used to not that, be. That is the, the used cooking oil collection business over the last 10 years has turned into a, a very complex multi-billion dollar industry uh, and it's becoming global. Uh, it, it used to be back when I was young, uh, you know, I used to work in, in, in restaurants, you know, in high school and, and I worked at McDonald's and you used to pay. And, and a lot of that used cooking well would end up in a landfill and you'd pay to get rid of it. Yeah. You know, now the, these collectors are, are actually paying the restaurant owners, uh, to, to, to be able to pick up that oil and, and they're aggregating it from you know a multitude of restaurants, taking it back into a central processing facility. They're boiling out the excess water. They're filtering out the you know the food particles and other solids that are in it, uh, and they're selling it off to uh, feed mills. They're selling it off to renewable diesel and biodiesel producers like you, like me. Yeah, uh, there's a middle. There's a middle. There's a middle step, uh, but it's gotten as you said that that thing has matured, and it sounds absolutely. like really better. That instead of just going out and dumping it down the drain or whatever, now mm-hmm. it's. The, you you can actually instead of paying to get rid of it, you get paid, and then you give them whatever it is your twenty gallons Correct. of Correct. oil or whatever. And, and, you know, it, it's gotten to the point now where you know a, a lot of the food suppliers like a Cisco or a, a U.S. Foods type of company, yep. uh, they are building into their agreements. Hey, we'll sell you this this clean five gallon bucket of fryer oil, but we reserve the right to come and get the used gallon or the you know the used bucket of oil when you're done with it. Yeah, so the you know even the food service companies are getting involved sure, you know, makes in, sense. in the in the collection of this oil. So um, I asked you about the people that are and the members of this. C- continue down that road because sure, it's, uh, it, it's a it, it's a very uh, you know wide spectrum of of people that are members and and will attend. And we we've got uh, you know members who are ocean going vessel brokers. We have members who are. You know that, that work with the railroads and and trucking companies. Uh, we have uh, members who are you know work for large global multinational uh, you know agricultural companies like an ADM or a Cargill. Uh, I want to talk to you about the multinational aspect of this. When the Russia invaded Ukraine there in uh, February March of this year. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of folks, you know, ask me and I said, hey, I'm not a global markets expert on commodities. I, I keep up, but that's not my expertise. But I can tell you this. And I talked about the oil. Ukraine makes like 70 percent of the maybe the world, but certainly the the region's sunflower exports. Yeah. And people are like, what? The, what? And again, the average person thinks yeah. well, sunflowers, you mean like you, know, you eat them when you're in a ball game? Like, yeah, that's like this much of sunflower production. Mm-hmm. Almost all sunflowers end up as oil. And that's the, I believe, one of the preferred oils in that area because they can grow it. Am I, tell me about that. Yeah, actually, I, I believe the number is more like 80% Russia and Ukraine are responsible for 80% of the global sunflower oil supply, which uh, of the total vegetable oils, it's it's a small percentage. Yeah, we still. However, and, and, and by 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 order, you correct me here, but I'm guessing it's just like everything: corn and then soybean are the two biggest, and then probably canola oil is our number. Yeah, three. canola, canola, rapeseed, palm oil is is a huge one. Not uh, here, but certainly in climatological areas where they don't grow corn and soybeans, but they can grow the hell out of palm trees. Well, right? you, you'd be surprised how much palm oil makes its way to the U.S., mostly going into into the food service. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there, there is a lot of of palm oil because of its its relative expense or inexpense compared to a canola or a soy. Uh, there is a lot of palm oil that is consumed in the U S right. So back to our point, sunflower oil is not a, is not the number one or two, probably not even three. Is it, is it corn first or is it soybean first? I believe it's soybean first. And then uh, to a lesser extent, corn and, and you know, rapeseed and, and canola, canola rapeseed. Well, my, my listeners know that rapeseed is canola and canola is rapeseed. By the way, I wrote about it in my book. 
uh, professors at Western Province Universities in Canada back in the 70s were pioneering this to make the, the rapeseed a more dominant crop. It fits their climate, and also it's a, it's got a really good oil, except that it was high in acid. So when they invented this, they were able to make it a low acidic oil, and they kept breading through genetics and all that to make a, a viable crop out of it. And then somebody said, yeah, we can't sell rapeseed. So hence canola, Canadian oil, low acid. That's how it got its name, Canadian oil, low acid. Anyway, boring you there, I know, Chris. Okay. No. So that sunflower thing, did that? Did you feel the thing with the Russia-Ukraine situation and the sunflower oil market being impacted? It was my understanding, like in Holland, Western Europe, there were shortages of ve- – you went to the grocery store and there wasn't no vegetable oil on the shelf. Mm-hmm. And it was like, how the hell am I going to go home and cook my mm-hmm. stir fry or you know, uh, make, bake, make cookies. I need oil. Yeah. And there was none there. A- absolutely. It, it, it's a rush when something like that happens. Obviously, if it would happen to soybean oil, there, there's, you know, much more pain felt and it's more widespread. But like, you know, in the example that you pointed out, there there's a rush, uh, you know, then to find alternatives. So if the if the sunflower oil isn't in a certain place, what can we use instead of it? And how do we get it here? And, you know, doing that, in a in a quick fashion isn't easy so you're going to see and you did see uh you know some some outages mm-hmm. yeah. uh, and you know, i'm sure the, the people that were responsible for the the sunflower supply chain were scrambling to find you know anything else that they could find you know whether it be palm oil soybean oil you know find a a suitable replacement mm-hmm. and it just took time to get that you know into place Interesting. What question did I not ask you? What thing do you know that nobody else does that's outside of the fats and oils industry? What thing is that that like that if you were saying here's something probably nobody knows? Boom. You got something like that for me? Um, you know, not really. I, I think just behind the scenes, the average consumer doesn't think when they pick up, you know, a, a package of pork chops to go home and make for dinner, how did it get there? And, <laughs> and the, you know, the process from you know, a, a, a pig squealing, you know, on a farm to, you know, th- those pork chops getting ready to hit to the grill, you know, and, and what happens in between is, is quite fascinating. And, you know, I, I've been doing this for 16 or 17 years now, uh, and, and it's kind of second nature, but it was a big surprise to see how these things worked and how developed that industry truly is and, and how much science goes into that. Yeah, um, pretty fascinating, you know, so isn't it? it? And it's, and then, uh, you know, the green crusaders would like us to never have fossil fuels, but then we know that that's it just, it's just not physically capable of getting away from those kinds of engines. And we talked about for freight, but also the green crusaders, uh, some of them are of the vegan crowd. Um, and they have this whole thing that we're going to save the earth if we stop eating livestock. And I'm like, but we don't stop eating. We still, everything we still grow has to have an impact. And I think that's you know kind of right in your alley also. Whether you bring in rendered pork fat and turn it into something or canola oil, it, it's all still a food product and byproducts, et cetera, et cetera. It's still kind of all a big chain. It It, it is. And, and another thing that, that you know, I, I don't want to start the food versus fuel argument here, but a, a lot of what we do provides value to the, the farmer and the ag industry where we are, are taking what used to be a waste product, we're providing value, you know, back to the farmer, uh, you know, for that. And and we're making the ultimate product, which, you know, in the fact of raising livestock is the protein. Mm -hmm. We're making the protein cheaper by providing more net back, you know, on the the rendered fats and, and, you know, what we're doing with the carcasses. Yeah. And, and again, that all by taking some, you know, there was a time I'm, I'm, I'm not too far from gas city, Indiana. There was a time when they used to dig down to try and get to the oil and they would burn up, burn up the natural gas because it was above it. Right. And mm-hmm. they just, and then they said, wait a minute, maybe we can use this stuff. It's kind of yeah. a similar thing you're talking about. We're discovering values. I had the ethanol guy on Jeff Cooper and talking about ethanol uh, a, six or 12 months ago. We talked about carbon dioxide. If the ethanol plants aren't going, one of their big byproducts is carbon dioxide. And people are like, well, I thought carbon dioxide was bad. Well, not when you are in the medical industry. Uh, the uh, welding and metals uh, uses carbon dioxide. Every lab uses carbon dioxide, a bunch of hospital usage, and obviously beverages. Without, They sell CO2 as a byproduct to put it in your beer or your, or your pop. pop. Um, I'm going to be there uh, October 13th at your event in Savannah. 
Um, I appreciate you being on here. You got anything on the, anything on the way out the door to wrap up that point? Because I know I interrupted you. No, uh, just keeping an eye to the weather. You know, fingers crossed that that everything is 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 good. Uh, you know, right now we're really looking forward to the event in Savannah. It's our first time there. Uh, obviously, with you know the the event being sold out, the the response has been good. Uh, we're hopeful that uh, everybody gets there safely and uh, has a good time. Well, what's interesting is I speak about the business of agriculture, hence this podcast right here. There's a lot of folks that wouldn't think that a guy in your situation, you're obviously probably have some kind of an engineering or chemistry background based on your your uh, fluent ability to speak about it. And there's some people that wouldn't think that you're in the ag industry. But if you were at a cocktail party, they said, what industry do you work in? You would probably say, I work in agriculture because you do. Uh, well, believe it or not, I'm, I'm a degreed accountant. Uh, <laughs> well, you well you, you roll words like glycol, gly, glycol ethylenes off your tongue pretty pretty handily for an accountant well I, i've been doing it for a long time so it, it's a learned behavior but do you think that you do you tell people you work in agriculture uh i tell people i work in agriculture i work in the fuels industry um you know, they're, they're both kind of interchangeable I think that they are. Thanks for being on here. His name's Chris Peterson. If you want to learn more about their company and what they do, it's called Hero BX. Hero like you are my hero, BX.com. I'm Damian Mason. This is, by the way, thank you, Chris, for being on here. My pleasure. See you in less than two weeks. This is the Business of Agriculture with me, Damian Mason. Till next time. Well, that concludes another fantastic episode of the Business of Agriculture. This episode was brought to you by Pattern Ag. You know, everybody in agriculture understands the importance of soil health. We also keep an eye on our soil better than we ever did through advanced soil testing. But what if there was a company that provided predictive analytics? Not just checking out nutrients and all the elements that are in there, but also could tell you the degree of risk you face with disease and pest pressure. That's right. Pattern Ag can do that. They actually can tell you, hey, you're going to have a real issue here. You can preemptively, proactively treat for corn rootworm or cyst nematode or sudden death syndrome before the problem actually starts costing you yield. Go to pattern.ag, that's www.pattern.ag to find the nearest rep that can help you start doing better for your soil. 